What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. This is episode 222. I'm the co-host, Kyle Anslone, joined today by co-host Connor Freeman. Connor, how are you doing today? I'm great, Kyle. How are you doing tonight? Doing well and very excited for today's episode because we got your brand new article out at the Libertarian Institute titled Cold War Served Hot to talk about. And, uh, you know, that's going to be a, a really great piece and we have the ability to break it down a little bit more than you did in the, in the article. So absolutely uh, excited to talk to you about that and just remind people where to find the show. And that is just like your article at the Libertarian Institute. Uh, I also write the daily news roundup there. The show is often at the blog at antiwar.com. And then you can find the video version on YouTube, Rumble, and Odyssey. Uh, also follow the uh, social media account on Twitter uh, at con underscore interest and then the Facebook page. You can donate to the show at Patreon, subscribe star or crypto and all that information is in the show notes page. And another way to support the show and also support yourself is by doing your CBD shopping at Paloma Verde. Paloma Verde CBD.com promo code piece that'll save you 25% off when you spend $75 or more and it gets the show a kit bad so great way again to support the show and get yourself some high quality uh well pri- uh you know a uh, good price CBD products Connor what are your favorite products at Paloma Verde my favorites are the soft gels and um I take the ones uh I take the regular ones, but I also got a sample from Carlos, the ones that have curcumin, which are also – they have additional like anti-inflammatory benefits, and uh, those are fantastic. I take them after meals. Always uh, feel great. I mean it's great for if you have any kind of anxiety or stress going on, if you're working out, make you feel better. Uh, you know, Anybody that takes CBD knows that if you use it, you know, it, once you use it, you realize you just feel better and, it, and you're in better health anyway, so you might as well take it, especially if you've got some pain or inflammation going on. It's perfect, and nobody does it better than Paloma Verde. I also really like the uh, tinctures, which you can get in like a variety of um, uh, sizes, but I mean, honestly, that's the strongest CBD you can get, and you take that after a meal, just take a couple drops or just one drop, and you'll be good for a few – for a good several hours. So I recommend it uh, strongly. And also the gummies are delicious and they're fast acting as well. And I like those. Yep. Paloma Verde, CBD.com, promo code PEACE. Connor, let's talk about your article, again, titled Cold War Served Hot and at the Libertarian Institute, running today as the spotlight on antiwar.com. Uh, fantastic and very important article that you have here, Connor. And, uh, you know, a lot of what you're doing is highlighting uh, the rhetoric that we're seeing among America's elected officials demanding Russian blood. And so go ahead and break us down and tell us what you wrote here. Yeah, sure. So uh, the I mean, the impetus for me writing this was really uh, I think it was probably two weeks ago. Maybe you did a great episode about this, about, uh, uh, you know, are, are the, is the CIA uh, building a Mujahideen in, in Ukraine? Uh, I think the title was approx- something approximating that. And, you know, this was the report that came out from Yahoo News. It was effectively, uh, uh, as I refer to in the piece, a, a Langley press release. Uh, and they came out and they said, that they were that that for since 2015, uh, they had been tr- they had the CIA ground unit ground paramilitary groups uh, in uh, in the southern U.S. at an, a secret base training uh, Ukrainian forces uh, for a, an insurgency, uh, and that they were training them how to kill in how to kill Russians. That's a quote. Um, and also, they revealed in the report that they had. Uh, been deploying for the same time, the same amount of time they had been deploying these CIA paramilitaries to the uh, Eastern Front in Ukraine, where the war was uh, has been uh, was going on and, and still is, but at a lower level now uh, since Minsk too. But nevertheless, they've been there the whole time advising Ukrainian forces. So, um, you know, just putting that out there into you know out you know out into the open for public consumption, uh, domestic consumption, and to you know as a threat to Russia, of course. Uh, sent off a lot of red flags for me. And then, of course, the New York Times, you know, it's interesting because they're they're interviewing, you know, these anonymous uh, national security officials, former national security officials who are explaining all this. And then the official CIA quote in the piece is, uh, you know, that we're not using this for offensive purposes. And then at the same time, uh, you had the New York Times put out a piece that said that the Biden administration was considering 
you know, launching an insurgency, supporting an insurgency against Russia in the event of an of an invasion. And there was some extremely uh, hawkish rhetoric in that, um, particularly from one particular uh, former Supreme Allied commander of NATO. So we'll get into all that. But, you know, the main point is that I'm talking about here is that, you know, for weeks now, so the main point here is that, uh, you know, I open it by discussing that they're, the hawks are talking openly about killing Russians again, which should, you know, I mean, that should cause serious, um, I mean, I don't know about, well, I guess, I, I mean, I suppose panic on the part of the domestic uh, population here. I mean, it shouldn't be, uh, you know, put out there for domestic consumption. You know, the last time this happened, as I point out, uh, you had, uh, you know, Trump running against Hillary Clinton and a bunch of Republicans in the primaries in 2015 and 2016 who were talking about putting a no fly, you know, uh, establishing a no fly zone in Syria and shooting down uh, Russian planes. Everybody thought that was, you know, absolutely insane. And uh, they rejected Hillary Clinton uh, and the hawks who were uh, talking like this. And, you know, they elected the wild card Trump. But, you know, within two years. He was bombing Russian mercenaries in Syria in February, early February of 2018. And, and as I say, nobody, you know, batted an eye. So now four years later, we have, you know, Biden's administration. We have the CIA. We have Stoltenberg, the secretary general of the of NATO. We have uh, Wesley Clark and this James Starvitis, um, the uh, another former Supreme Allied commander of NATO and um, uh, Evelyn uh, Farkas or Farakas, who is the one of the most hawkish. Uh, people out there demanding, uh, you know, this kind of action get going now. Uh, and she's a former deputy assistant secretary of defense. So we'll start by, uh, and of course the Congress. So I'll start by talking about, of course, we have Robert Menendez, the ultra hawk chairman of the Senate foreign relations committee who int uh, introduced a bill with a bunch of Senate Democrats with him leading it, uh, that would virtually declare, you know, total economic war on Russia, cut them off from the international system, uh, you know, shut down, it would aim to shut down Nord Stream 2, um, you know, uh, send an additional $500 million of military aid to Ukraine on top of the 300 million uh, that Congress has already committed to in the 2022 NDAA. Um, and, and uh, you know, they even list out, as I say, their military industrial complex wish list includes anti-armor weapon systems, mortars, crew served uh, weapons and ammunition, grenade launchers and ammunition, anti-tank weapon systems, anti-ship weapon systems, anti-aircraft weapon systems, and small arms and ammunition. And, you know, what's terrifying about this beyond all that is if if it's passed, and I believe they're voting on it next week, um, it the whole the whole all that can be triggered if Biden just determines that Moscow is quote knowingly supporting a significant escalation and hostile action in or against Ukraine prior to December first, twenty twenty one. We had, uh, you know, the mainstream media, uh, CNN, Natasha Bertrand, the Russia Gate propagandist, uh, putting out a story, of course, that said that the Russians are planning a false flag against uh, the ethnic Russians in the Donbass with, um, you know, uh, sort of deniable forces that they have that are trained in urban warfare and expl using explosives and that they were going to use an attack on, you know, you know, the, the, the separatists that they support in the East uh, in order to manufacture a casus belli for an invasion. Um, and as I say here, I mean, it's akin to Obama setting out all, you know, red lines in, 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 uh, in Syria. This is virtually an invitation to anti-Russian forces and covert operators, including the ones that, you know, are backed by the U.S. or being advised by the CIA to go ahead and attack and start trouble uh, that can be just deemed Russian aggression and, and lead to war. Um, of course, we had Roger Wicker, the, the, you know, as far as the GOP has been awful. Uh, we had Roger Wicker, of course, infamously going on, I think, Neil Cavuto's show and saying uh, we should, uh, you know, he's talking about military action and putting troops on the ground and never take uh, first use nuclear action off the table. And we should, you know, we should have maybe have ships stand off in the Black Sea and rain destruction down on Russian military capabilities. Um we had, uh, you know, and I and I point out that as all this is going on, it's practically thwarting all the opportunities we have for, you know, a resolution to the crisis. Because, uh, you know, as since talks began after the Russians were able to get uh, these talks going with the Americans here in January after the uh, the Russian holidays, um, 
you know, it started coming out that you know, things, at least ostensibly, there were no like, um, you know, they had rejected the uh, the uh, the Russia's demand to close the door to NATO membership for Ukraine and Georgia. However, um, you know, there it was coming out, you know, that they were that not only had Biden promised uh, to, you know, not place offensive strike weapons in Ukraine, I believe on his phone in his phone call with Putin on December 30th, and Ray McGovern has referred to, referred to that numerous times in his articles recently. Uh, but not only that, I mean, they were talking about restoring. There's they are talking about restoring the INF treaty. Uh, limiting the scope of, of NATO drills in, in the region, as well as Russian drills, adding more transparency, uh, missile placements, uh, and limiting, you know, pulling, you know, NATO troops off of Russia's borders, um, and, you know, preventing accidents occurring in the air and sea with all the different, um, you know, I think Russia is very concerned, of course, uh, and we know they are. I mean, that's w w arguably what provoked all this to begin with, uh, particularly this year. Uh, you know, the NATO bombers and warships constantly in the Black Sea. Um, and so, you know, things were actually, if you were, you know, as we were covered, as, we, as we've covered on the show, going in a good direction when you consider the fact that the Russians had taken, you know, 10,000 troops off the border with Ukraine. They had rounded up and, uh, you know, arrested and, and seized the assets of the Reveal uh, ransomware group in Russia who had been accused of uh, carrying out the colonial pipeline hack. Um, I think arguably you could say even the CIA coming out last week and saying that Havana syndrome is not caused by a, you know, this mysterious <laughs> uh, syndrome is not caused by a foreign power uh, and that it's not Russia that is to blame for this. I think that could be looked at as, um, you know, a, sort of a show of goodwill here. Um, uh, Biden, you know, uh, as I said, uh, not only said that he wouldn't place offensive strike weapons uh, in Ukraine, although that was more, you know, seen in the Russian media uh, and in official, you know, Russian uh, press releases uh, from the Kremlin, but not, uh, you know, it wasn't hyped up in the mainstream media. In fact, I think Ray even said to Scott Horton on his show that when Sullivan, Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, was asked if anything, you know, notable uh, came out of that phone call with Biden, he sort of uh, scratched his uh, his chin and said, no, no, I don't, not really. Um, but, if, you know, so they wanted to downplay this. But, you know, uh, they also, you know, Biden even said in his uh, press conference uh, recently that they would not uh, consider, um, well, if, if Ukraine made what he called a, or excuse me, if Russia made a, what he referred to as a small incursion, a small invasion into Ukraine, that the U.S. might not react. Well, this set off, uh, especially the GOP Senate uh, senators, uh, you know, off and they just became they went ballistic. Uh, you know, Tom, they, the Armed Services Committee and the Foreign Relations Committee senators came out and just gave speech after speech at these conference, these press conferences. Uh, Tom Cotton came out and called him impotent and incompetent. Uh, you know, the virtual neocon spokesman in the Senate. Uh, let's see. So, the, you know, and you had, uh, you know. Roger Wicker, again, coming out with uh, these other, like I said, at these conferences and saying that we need to give Putin a bloody nose and enhance U.S. and NATO support for Ukraine. Um, you had, uh, as far as Democrats go, Richard Blumenthal, who's a multimillionaire senator who, uh, you know, visited Kiev with a Senate um, delegation that included, you know, Amy Klobuchar uh, and again, Roger Wicker, among others. And uh he pledged that the U.S. would impose crippling sanctions, crippling economic sanctions, and give the people of Ukraine the arms, the lethal arms they need to defend their lives and livelihood. Um, and of course, after all of this, uh, you know, the next day, because of this reaction to Biden's comment about the small incursion, you had Ben Shapiro, uh, you know, going attacking him, and you know, all the hawks from across the the media um, landscape. He walked back. I mean, the, the first of all, his handlers in the White House issued a statement where they said, President Biden has been clear with the Russian president. If any Russian military forces move across the Ukrainian border, that's a renewed invasion and it will be met with a swift, severe and united response from the United States and our allies. So, you know, again, uh, it, 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 they're trying to tie Biden's hands here. Uh, and um, we have sent, uh, you know, recent, when Blinken visited Kiev recently, they announced another, uh, the State Department announced another $200 million in military aid was being delivered from the U.S. to Kiev. Uh, and I believe um, at this point, is it uh, 80 tons of the Javelin uh, anti-tank missiles and the launchers? 
Yeah, they're they're just pouring in, uh, you know, weapons like they did in Syria. They measure it by the tonnage they they bring in so many. And so I had heard that it was uh, 90 tons earlier in the week of uh, some different weapons and I think some small arms and then 80 tons of the Javelin missiles. Now, I'm not sure how many Javelin missiles and launchers 80 tons equal. Uh, I think those things are kind of shoulder fired though, or maybe like on a tripod or something, but I think a soldier could carry them around. So it seems like it would be uh, quite a number of them. They're also bringing in the javelins and stingers from the Baltic states right now. And the UK just brought in a thousand, uh, I believe they were anti-armor uh, type weapons, but uh, a UK made one, not like a javelin or anything like that. So yeah, the, the weapons are piling in uh to ukraine at this point although you know as uh i believe scott has brought this up recently that even the the rand corporation admits that you know it's not going to make any difference on the ground or anything like that uh this is you know all great for the military industrial complex but you know isn't going to do anything for the american people and uh you know this isn't in the rand study connor but to me it, it seems like you know this is uh, maybe a way at this point, again, where, you know, they're using the phrase, give Putin a bloody nose or something like that. Well, you know, maybe they could do that by baiting him into Ukraine or something and then having the insurgents they train do that. But I don't know what, you know, you know what I mean? Like, that's kind of my concern is what they're thinking long term here are that these weapons are going to be uh, used actually against Putin, not to necessarily stop an invasion of Ukraine, uh, but rather just to kill a bunch of Russian soldiers and make the invasion that much more difficult and uh, in that way give Russia a bloody nose. And so, you know, I don't see, it, despite the U.S. always claiming that, you know, we have to give these weapons to Ukraine. I think they even named the bill uh, that's going to be voted on in the House next week, the Ukraine uh, Defense Society. Sovereignty Act or Sovereignty Defense Act. And, it, you know, it's not about defending the people of Ukraine. If anything, this puts a bigger target on their back. It makes them more likely to end up killed in a war. Absolutely. And it's why we're seeing, uh, as you covered recently, you know, resistance from the French and the Germans, because the Europeans and the Ukrainians and the Russians, of course, would bear the, you know, the worst brunt of all of this. But of course, it's, you know, a huge uh, boondoggle for the military industrial complex. And our Congress is, you know, virtually, uh, in their pockets. So, uh, and, and, you know, just, it, it's unbelievable. So actually, you know, yeah, I mean, the Canadians sent special forces there. I mean, the, the English have been sending, uh, special forces and more commandos and trainers along with their, sh their anti-tank missiles and their short range missiles. And when they started sending those missiles, you had, you know, Republican lawmakers coming out demanding that, uh, that Biden follow suit. And it, and it appears that he has, um, uh, now as far as, uh, the New York Times article I was referring to when they talk about, you know, setting up this insurgency, the rhetoric was insane. So they interviewed this guy named James uh, Stavridis, who's a retired four star Navy. I think it's Admiral. Stavridis, by the way. But oh, OK. Yeah. So when they interview Stavridis is a retired four star uh, four star Navy Admiral, uh, former Supreme Allied commander at NATO. And he says, if Putin invades Ukraine with a major military force, U.S. and NATO military assistance, intelligence, cyber, anti-armor and anti-air weapons, offensive naval missiles would ratchet up significantly. If it turned into a Ukrainian insurgency, Putin should realize that after fighting insurgencies ourselves for two decades, we know how to arm, train and energize them. And he says the level of military support for a Ukrainian insurgents would make our efforts in Afghanistan against the Soviet Union look puny by comparison. And I mentioned here that uh, for perspective, Operation Cyclone, the CIA's program in Afghanistan, is commonly estimated to have killed a million people. Um, so and then they also mentioned here that Lloyd Austin, uh, the defense secretary and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Mark Milley, uh, warn their Russian counterparts in recent telephone calls that any swift Russian victory in Ukraine will probably be followed by a bloody insurgency similar to the one that drove the Soviet Union from Afghanistan. And it says, in discussions with allies, senior Biden officials have made clear that the CIA covertly and the Pentagon overtly would both seek to help any Ukrainian insurgency. Uh, we, of course, had Wesley Clark coming out and signing a letter with the former deputy secretary of state, um, Strobe Talbot, uh, I think from the Eurasia Center, and, uh, where they were demanding that Biden send Stinger missiles, among other weapons, to Kiev. Um, and then 
uh, as I was writing it, the news came out that they, uh, the piece, uh, the news came out that the U.S. had greenlit the Baltic states to send uh, those Stinger missiles uh, to uh, Ukraine. Um, and uh, and of course, now there's this controversy over this because the Germans have stopped the Estonians from sending uh, German artillery piece uh, artillery pieces uh, to uh, Ukraine because the new ruling coalition has a policy against sending weapons to, uh, active, uh, to conflict zones. Uh, and so of course the Germans are getting, I mean, they're actually, as you reported, they're starting these, uh, restarting these sort of Normandy format style talks in Paris, which could be a very good sign because they could probably help, um, either with, you know, coordinating with the Americans or not, they could, you know, ass hopefully assure the Russians that they will oppose, uh, you know, NATO membership as they have in the past for Ukraine. Uh, but uh, of course now the Germans are also, I mean, the, the, it's even mentioned, uh, I believe in the BBC that as they were flying, uh, uh, sh uh, shipments of weapons to Ukraine, they had to bypass uh, German airspace and fly North, uh, through Denmark. Um, so, and, and, and when Biden wanted to speak apparently with, uh, uh, Olaf Scholz, the new German chancellor about the Ukraine crisis, they said no. So, I mean, there's, there's, as there's quite a, uh, I mean, the fissures within NATO over this policy are becoming more and more stark. Um, now on the eve of the talks with NATO, uh, you know, very, uh, provocatively, you had Jen Stoltenberg, the NATO secretary general come out and say, you know, he's warning Russia of severe costs and saying, if negotiations fail, NATO is pre prepared for a new armed conflict in Europe. And now potentially, I mean, the worst uh, of the Hawks is Elevin, uh, uh, Evelyn Farkas, who is the former deputy assistant, tech, uh, assistant secretary of defense for Russia, Ukraine and Eurasia in Obama's administration. And she said in an interview um, with the, the actually the New York Times article I was just quoting from, it ends with her saying uh, that the, this time the glove should come off. And then in other uh, and she's also been quoted in other uh, reports that she's written or interviews. She says, we must use our military to roll back Russians, even at the risk of direct combat. Uh, Newsweek ran a piece recently about the Nazi problem in Ukraine's uh, security forces. And they asked her about that. And she says uh, her response was pretty shocking. She says, they right now have existential issues to deal with. And the far right groups are helping defend Ukraine. So at this moment in time, the Ukrainian government needs all the help it can get from its citizens, regardless of their ideology. And then she otherwise in, uh, I think, I believe this report, uh, she had written a piece about this. And she said, we must not only condemn Russia's illegal occupations of Ukraine and Georgia, but we must demand a withdrawal from both countries by a certain date and organize coalition forces willing to take action to enforce it. Uh, and I compare this, of course, to, you know, the previous, uh, you know, in 2008, the war with Georgia, where uh, because the uh, you know, as Andrew Coburn says, I quote him here, that minions, uh, you know, close to Dick Cheney were providing him uh, back channel assurances that in the event of a war with Russia, they would ultimately, you know, the Americans would ultimately back them up. So they attacked South Ossetia and they uh, hit uh, Russian peacekeeping forces who were there. Um, they attacked Russian peacekeeping forces there who were uh, pr protect, uh, maintaining, um, excuse me, defending the autonomy of the breakaway province under a deal that had been brokered by the EU. And so when that uh, war started and the Russians pushed them back, uh, the Cheney was advocating bombing Russians under the Caucasus Mountains. And there's a whole piece I linked to where Andrew Coburn talks about uh, the trouble that uh, Condoleezza Rice had gone through, among others, to make sure that uh, Cheney wasn't able to, if that if he was going to be meeting with Bush during this time, that she was there and the others were there to provide a counter argument so that he wouldn't just go along with this, uh, you know, with Cheney in his face, you know, telling him to bomb the Russians. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, McCain supported this like he did the coup in uh, Ukraine. And I point out, as uh, as Coburn points out in his piece, that shockish, you know, in the same way that I think Zelensky and and the Ukrainians uh, understand uh, the American political system, that by you know constantly hyping up the threat of uh, you know the Ru Rush the Russians and a Russian invasion, that they can get more arms sales and more you know money from uh, more money and support from the EU and and NATO and the Americans, and they say uh, you know he says here it's sort of uh, it gives shed some light on all this. It says that Shakishvili, of 
course, who had been, you know, he was uh, put in power during the um, Rose Revolution in 2003 under the Bush administration, a color-coded uh, revolution, and then they had provided military aid to Tbilisi for years. Um, but it also mentions here, uh, Coburn mentions that to bolster his standing in the American Capitol, Shakashvili hired Randy Shuneman, a Republican lobbyist and the executive director of the Committee for the Liberation of Iraq, a neocon group formed in 2002 under the chairmanship of none other than Bruce Jackson, a senior Lockheed executive and vice president uh, of, uh, of uh, Lockheed. Um, and uh, he was also the president of the Committee to Expand NATO. You know, which gets into the history, of course, of how the NATO expansion beginning in the 1990s was largely a project of the military industrial complex. Um, and uh, ultimately, uh, I, I was kind of flabbergasted at these comments that were being made uh, in, the, in particularly that New York Times article where the author says that this conversation has revived the specter of a new Cold War and subtly made real the prospect of the beginnings of so-called great power conflict. And so I go through you know, briefly the history of the new Cold War, beginning with, you know, America rigging Russia's elections and the economic shock therapy policies of the Harvard boys, uh, you know, sending Russia into poverty levels uh, worse than the Amer during the American Great Depression, uh, lowering life expectancy by double digits, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, looting and liquidating entire industries and handing them over to oligarchs and gangsters. Um, uh, you know, of course, uh, adding, uh, you know, Clinton added uh, Poland, the Czech Republic and Hungary into NATO. Uh, you know, we overthrew the government of Kiev twice, uh, put Nazis in power on Russia's doorstep in, in 2014 and left the door open for NATO membership. You constantly have bombers and warships in the Black Sea, um, you know, medium range missiles in the Baltic Sea on ships and the MK-41 uh, missile launchers at the so-called anti-ballistic missile sites in uh, Romania and Poland. That can, of course, be retrofit to, you know, fire off H-bomb tipped uh, Tomahawk cruise missiles. And I talk about, of course, the arms treaties that were ripped up by the Bush government and the Trump administration, you know, the anti-ballistic missile treaty, the INF treaty, open skies. Um, and so it's just ironic to see somebody act like, oh, we're all of a sudden we're in this new Cold War. Um, when, of course, it's been going on for practically 30 years. And uh, it's gotten worse and worse. We might have hit a tipping point now where we're really no longer in Charles Kruthammer's, you know, unip unipolar moment uh, fantasy. And that's all the euphoria of all that is kind of wearing off after all the disasters in the Middle East. And, you know, uh, we're 30 trillion plus. Uh, um, what I mean, the national debt, I, I've actually looked at it recently, but it's it's over or approximately 30 trillion at this point. Right. I believe so. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, and you're looking at uh, we just we're picking fights with China, Russia and Iran seemingly all at the same time um, and just disastrous policies and, and sanctions on all these different countries across the planet from Venezuela to from Cuba to North Korea. Um, and it's it's coming to an end. Uh, and I guess the point I'm making here is that the American people should realize and I, I run through you know, our policy currently in Afghanistan, in Yemen, in Syria brutalizing uh, populations in, in very poor countries, um, you know, with sanctions, economic warfare, in the case of Yemen, of course, a genocidal war. And so it's just not it's not in America's interest, let alone to fight a war in, in Ukraine. But we're not in any place to be the moral arbiters of uh, the so-called rules based international order, or any such uh, neoconservative nonsense. Um, and I think it's it's important for us as as p as a the american people to come together and and figure out a way to put all this to an end because um at this point if you know the if all of our, the elected representatives are out calling for as we said russian blood there's a lot of work to be done uh to put a stop to that and um but it is heartening to see as we've seen there's a great piece at responsible statecraft now about polling numbers and you discussed recently that show that the american people don't really support any of this um Although uh, there is there does seem to be some support, of course, for sanctions and sending military equipment to uh, Ukraine. But I'm thankful, of course, that there's uh, less and less support for war and that hopefully a lot of this is exposing um, the American empire for what it is to the American people right now. 
Yeah. Well, Connor, I, I mean, that was a really good article, and I recommend that everybody go to the Institute and read it, but you did an excellent job of breaking that down, providing so much more background. So um, anyways, anytime you write an article, we'll definitely be talking about it on the show like we did that one. But if you're ready, let's get into some China news, because there's a, a lot of important stuff going on with this, and that includes uh, Taiwan's vice president, We'll be making a couple stops this week in the U.S. I believe that's actually happening tomorrow, maybe. Uh, we have uh, Taiwan's Vice President William Lai will transit in the United States, uh, and he's going to make stops in San Francisco and Los Angeles, I believe, on his way to Honduras. Now, the reason that this is significant, of course, Connor, is that China considers Taiwan essentially a breakaway separatist government, and this is the equivalent of the you know, United States meet with the vice president of a separatist government. Obviously, you could get to Taiwan uh, from Honduras to Taiwan without going through the United States. But, you know, they're choosing to do so uh, to continue the increase of diplomatic ties between the United States and Taiwan and uh, further kind of flaunting the strategic ambiguity and uh, one China policy that the U.S. has at least in name uh, adopted and proclaimed to, you know, follow over the past, you know, what, four or five decades now. So, uh, you know, the, the fact that we're having further erosion of that is pretty significant. Uh, the U.S. is looking for ways to potentially accelerate the delivery of Taiwan's next generation of F-16 fighter jets. And I believe those are the uh, F-15E uh variants that uh, Taiwan is buying a bunch of. And so... They're looking for ways to uh, get those to Taiwan faster. Overall, I'm not sure how much of a difference it'll make how many, you know, F-16 teams that Taiwan has. Now, it, it, it certainly wouldn't be an easy invasion of Taiwan for China or anything like that. But, you know, if if China really want to invest resources in taking Taiwan back, uh, probably kind of like Russia-Ukraine situation, there's not a whole lot America could do to prevent it. And so... You know, what we're seeing, uh, of course, I think responses from these actions from China, uh, including uh, by China flying 39 warplanes into Ch Taiwan's air defense identification zone. Now, of course, on the show in the past, we have, uh, you know, broken down and explained that the very important difference between an ADIZ and then actual airspace. And so, you know, the, the Chinese, uh, they, they have a map here if anybody wants to look. You know, they're flying through uh, the southwest corner of the ADIZ. I think the most significant thing about this uh, group of flights was that it was the largest num <laughs> number uh, of flights since the fall. And that a bomber was included in, in these flights. And so that that was uh, atypical. But uh, looking at the map, China has out, actually carried out much more significant incursions of the ADIZ in the past. And so, uh, the, the, you know, this may not be the most significant thing. So, uh, you know, uh, this is, of course, in relation to Taiwan. Connor, but also probably has something to do uh, with the massive amount of American freedom of navigation operations going on right now in the South China Sea. Uh, of course, we covered recently that the uh, USS uh, Carl Vinson and the uh, USS Etsits, which uh, is a, you know, uh, I believe a destroyer that could handle some aircraft, were carrying out dual operations. And then we had the USS uh, I think it's the Banford, uh, Benfold, uh, carry out uh, some close passes of the Spratly Islands. And now we have two more aircraft carriers, the USS Abraham Lincoln and again the Carl Vinson carrying out operations in the South China Sea. Now, as I discussed on the last episode of the show, Connor, uh, there was another mishap on the, the Carl Vinson. Uh, this time an F-35 apparently was lost to the sea. Uh, so some kind of uh, incident occurred during landing. Seven sailors were injured, uh, including the pilot. Three were treated on the ship, and so you assume the injuries are not very significant. Four were airlifted, unclear exactly as to what those injuries are, but uh, to my understanding, we're over like, you know, uh, a full day later, and there's no reports of critical condition or uh, death, and so likely everybody is going to survive, but this will be uh, the fifth major incident on the Carl Vinson in the past um, 
two months and all of those uh were incidents that cost you know over 2.5 million dollars to the taxpayer so i think that's most of the news i had on china uh connor do you have anything that you want to add in here i think you're muted I have a report here from uh, RT as well that talks about uh, the U.S. Navy sending uh, two supercarriers for drills into the Philippine Sea. Uh, so this was with uh, Japanese allies, uh, two aircraft carriers, two amphibious ships, and dozens of fighter jets. Uh, again, this is the supercarrier USS Carl Vinson uh, and the Abraham Lincoln um, with uh, amphibious assault ships, USS America and the USS Essex, uh, guided missile cruisers, um, 26 aircraft and the destroyers USS Prudence, USS Chafee, and USS Gridley. And uh, the uh, the Japanese had contributed a destroyer to this as well. And um, there's uh, – if people can look up this uh, article, there's – it's called – U.S. Navy displays two supercarriers in Philippine Sea uh, drill. The footage that comes out of it is absolutely uh, uh, it's, uh, frankly, it's revolting. I mean, it's a massive, massive drill, massive show of force. And of course, we're on the uh, the eve of the um, of the Beijing Olympics, everything going on right now. So this is um, you know a major slap in the face to the Chinese, and especially with everything going on with Russia, just showing how completely detached from reality the. Uh, this administration and the Pentagon really is. And, and, you know, for Americans who only see that footage on Twitter and only in the context of look how cool and big and badass our military is boy, our seven fleet boys from indo Pacom are keeping us safe. And look how cool it looks when all these ships fl- uh, sail in a formation with the bombers and F 35s overhead and everything like that. But we really have to imagine what if that was Chinese aircraft carrier sailing, a you know, a couple, uh, you know, dozen miles off the Pacific coast or in the Gulf of Mexico or something like that and how uh, intimidating and you know scary that would at least be portrayed in the US media as something like that was happening so uh, yeah interesting but- contrast there Vice Admiral Carl Thomas commander of the seventh fleet said uh, this show of strength is freedom at its finest yeah uh, and of course like what you said I mean this is why the Russians are talking about uh, not ruling out sending Russian forces to Cuba Venezuela. Um, you know, there's been discussion how if, if talks appear to be failing uh, here in the in the near future, they may reveal strategic agreements they have with, uh, I believe, Nicaragua and Venezuela. And I'm sure it relates to that as well, about sending Russian forces into Latin America uh, and challenging the Monroe Doctrine, essentially, because, as I say in the in my piece, that the idea, I suppose, is that uh, – the American sphere of influence extends to the whole world and uh, Russian and Chinese red lines mean absolutely nothing. Yeah. Um, it's why, I mean, even though the Chinese said what they said and threatened consequences about this recent uh, passage of the, uh, uh, the Spratly Islands uh, and the Paracel Islands, uh, I'm sure it'll, it will hap- we'll have more news like this next week anyway. So, yeah. So, you know, one thing I want to mention on Russia, uh, and I think you maybe did in your your piece there, but just, you know, that the the Ukrainian government has been saying and Zelensky is now saying that, look, you know, there's not a significant buildup or anything like that. And there's, you know, really no increased Russian threat since April or going all the way back to 2014 and trying to downplay the threat. But, you know, I feel like this is another indication of that, Connor, that if the Americans really thought that Russia was about to invade invade uh ukraine will we have two aircraft carriers in the south china sea does that seem like you know a wise place to position you know some of your most critical and advanced military equipment you know you're on the other side of china from russia or at least you know if they were out maybe in the the korean sea or something they're a little bit closer to russia but what exactly is you know the point of deploying the, these advanced carriers to this region if again you're worried about gaining a conflict with russia unless uh, i guess maybe that you know the uh the eggheads that are a part of the foreign policy blob now have completely lost the lessons from you know the hearts of the cold war who at least understood that you needed to balance russia and china against each other and think that well if you're picking a fight with russia then china might try to take the the uh taiwan or hong kong or do something like that so we need even more military presence to confront china because you know russia may invade uh ukraine so maybe that's the way they're looking at it but my take is more that you know 
they really aren't that concerned about an invasion of Ukraine if, if they're putting this many uh, military assets so far away from that issue. Yeah, and of course, yeah, like you said, the Ukrainian uh, foreign ministry is is again throwing cold water on all this. Uh, the Americans pulling their uh, you know non essential uh, diplomats and their families out and issuing all these new don't travel advisories, and they came out and said something like they're safer here than they are in Los Angeles or any crime ridden uh, U.S. city. Uh, I think Joseph Burrell, the EU uh, foreign policy chief, came out and had a I believe it was his quote that said, uh, "Don't dramatize this." We're not taking anybody out. Uh, it's not necessary right now. And 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 Zelensky is saying more things uh, like this as well. Um, so, uh, it, but but Saki, I just read a report over the wire from uh, uh, Dave DeCamp about this on anti-war that uh, that Saki is coming out and basically go, no, 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 it is him. And like you know, it's it's. Uh, I mean, they're trying to hang on to this. Um, I mean, hopefully it's so that if if there's a a good resolution here between, um, you know, uh, Putin and Biden uh, that they can say pull this off and try and use it as like a political win, uh, you know, because they're going to have to have something if they uh, make the necessary concessions to the Russians in order to resolve this uh, crisis. Um, But at the same time, yeah, I mean, it, it looks to me, as you said, it's like. It, the policy doesn't make sense unless you believe it is just about hyping up tensions and spending more and more money on the military, which seems to be all Congress is interested in doing. All right, Connor, let's wrap up talking about Syria here, where there's been a lot of uh, fighting in different regions going on in the past month between different groups. And so I want to break some of that down. Uh, right at the beginning of January, the U.S. carried out strikes against a position that it said was attempting to assemble rocket launchers to then uh, target U.S. forces. Then a couple, uh, I think a day later, actually, there was a uh, group of attack or rockets that struck a base in Syria that sometimes U.S. soldiers or at least contractors are at, and this was a a part of uh, the uh, remembrance of the Soleimani on the second year of his death, various uh, groups a part of the, you know, the vague axis of resistance, uh, the Shia militias in Iraq, the Houthis, the the Shia militias in uh, Syria carried out these attacks. So, you know, the, there's fighting going on um, seemingly between Shia militias and uh, the United States or, you know, the Assad Iranian backed militias in, in Syria and the United States. And then you also have fighting between Turkey and the PKK going on or the YPG, uh, kind of whatever side of the, the Turkish Syrian border they're on there. They're either called the PKK, which is the Turkish side, uh, the YPG, the Syrian Kurdish side. There was a report uh, that 12 members of the Syrian Kurdish YPG were killed after uh, uh, three Turkish soldiers were killed uh, when their vehicles struck an IED. There's also continued suicide bombing going on uh, in the northeastern, uh, northwestern Syria region. Uh, I think this is mainly in uh, Turkish-controlled territory, and it's exactly unclear to me of who's carrying out these uh, suicide bombings, Connor. The Turks always blame it, of course, on the Kurds. However, the, the suicide bombings are far more traditional uh, you know, trademark of the, the you know, Salafist, uh, jihadist, you know, Sunni type groups, which isn't really the ideology of the Kurds, not that the Syrian Kurds don't carry out their own kinds of war crimes, but I don't think largely that includes suicide bombings. Now, they are occupied in this region by a very hostile Turkish force, and so if they're resulting to suicide bombings, maybe, maybe that is happening, but there's also the fact that you had the various uh, leftover uh, uh, resistance to Assad groups, the, the Sunni groups. And, you know, these include people from the spectrum of like uh, Ari al-Sham to HTS, uh, the, you know, straight up Al-Qaeda boys, the leftover of uh, the ISIS forces there, uh, Denor al-Zinki, uh, very Salafist groups. And, and any of these groups, I think, could be also behind the suicide bombings, depending on who's being targeted and maybe even how they feel about the Kurds uh, or the, excuse me, the Turks 
that particular week. I wouldn't be surprised if the Salafists turned on the Turks and were taking them out. Of course, there's fighting going on in the Idlib province of Syria. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of details on what's happening there. There's reports of Syrian or Russian airstrikes uh, infrequently against those positions. And of course, uh, reports of fighting amongst the various uh, groups that are all opposed to Assad, but are also various brands of jihadists and Salafists and uh, take on each other too. Although the major fighting going on right now in Syria, Connor, is uh, this Syrian Democratic Forces, which is uh, the the larger umbrella group that includes the the YPG, the Syrian Kurds, and this is the group in uh, Syria that the U.S. bats. We have 900 troops approximately in this region uh, that help the SDF to occupy. And while this does include a lot of you know traditionally Kurdish lands, it also includes uh, like Al Raqqa and uh, parts of Deir al Azor, which are more traditionally uh, like. Sunni Arab cities and not Kurdish cities. And so, you know, there are parts of what the U.S. is doing here in Syria that's a complete occupation. There's also a bunch of prison camps littering this area. And I'm typically talking about the Al Hall uh, prison camp, which is where a lot of uh, women and children who were the wives and children of ISIS fighters are held. A lot of these peer people are not Syrian nationals. And so the Syrian Kurds really don't have anything to do with them. Uh, some of them are Iraqi nationals, except when they ship them to Iraq, Iraq typically sends them in mass trials to death. And then the Western countries or any other nation on earth essentially does everything they can to not take these people back. And so, you know, Connor, th th it would be one thing if this situation took a year to work out, but you know, we're now many years past, like five years, what past the fall of Raqqa and essentially like, you know, the, the Islamist state being dissolved. I guess maybe two or three years ago, they had lost all their official territory and everything like that. But you've had children who have now grown up in these uh, Syrian prison camps. Now, this is a different one. This is a prison that uh, I, I understand mainly held Islamic State fighters. However, 600 of the detainees in this prison were under the age of 18. And so I don't, you know, maybe these are like male children of ISIS fighters, maybe, you know, they're 16 year olds and stuff who got conscripted by ISIS. I'm not exactly sure, but there's 3,500 prison in the, the, this, uh, people in this prison. Uh, and while I guess they say a lot of them are ISIS fighters, I'm not exactly sure what the numbers are, uh, but ISIS launched an attack against this prison. They initially used a couple of car bombs to get in and then, uh, were able to take, over a significant portion of that prison. Apparently once, um, you know, they, they start to make some inroads. Then the prisoners got a hold of the guards and their weapons. And it was absolutely on. And of course, having, uh, potentially thousands of ISIS fighters here is a lot of people to immediately pick up arms and to be being against the SDF side. And so, uh, this happened, I believe last Thursday, Connor. So we're almost five days past now. And, uh, you know, you kept seeing reports saying ISIS, uh, surrendered and the SDF had control over the situation. And then every day you would also hear that, Oh, no, the fighting's ongoing. And so apparently there was a convoy of American forces that were headed to the region and and the U.S. did carry out airstrikes against this prison. There's a report that, you know, at least 200 people have been killed in this fighting. But I don't think we'll have the actual numbers uh, until, you know, the aid groups get in and the fighting is completely, uh, completely halted, Connor. But this is uh, fairly significant for a lot of reasons. It's the, certainly the most substantial attack that the Islamist State has carried out in the past few years. And uh, it involved the Americans having to get involved to, to put down the ISIS threat. And so, you know, you kind of got to wonder what the U.S. has been doing uh, in this region of Syria, which we occupy, if uh, the, the ISIS guys are breaking loose. So, 
Uh, real pr real problems here. Interesting, and of course, uh, anytime you're bombing a prison, you run the risk of what you know happened in uh, Yemen, where you you know, you have collapses and people who obviously can't get out because you're in a building that collapsed and in a prison cell, and uh, and and so the death toll climbs very high, very fast. And of course, there are uh, underage people in this prison, and uh, you know I'm not exactly sure, Connor, if everybody who ends up in an SDF prison is really a criminal, and how many of them are just you know kind of unfortunate people who got thrown in there for something they they really weren't doing or you know people who got conscripted into isis you know isis was going to shoot you in the head or you held in you know ak-47 for isis and then uh you know you got arrested by the sdf after you surrendered and now you've spent eight, five years in this uh, you know isis prison camp thing uh, uh, just, just a terrible situation connor um let's see a few more stories on uh on syria that are important german troops are going to start withdrawing and ending their military support in syria although they will be staying in iraq uh al-qaeda this is hilarious connor harit Tahrir al-sham which is uh formerly jabhat al-nusra which you know better known as al-qaeda uh's branch in syria is planning to hold elections uh to make themselves more uh palatable to uh people in the west and so uh they're also i guess you know kind of pulling back on the morality police they have on the street not so many not quite so many beatings of women who uh go around without a male escort or anything like that obviously al jalani is a terrorist however uh you know kind of like with the situation we have in ukraine the u.s always finds a way to ally itself with extremists to take on a government that it doesn't like and so uh, you, you know, I, I think it's very possible that the idea of elections and removing the, the morality police and then uh, Al Jolani, the, the leader of uh, Al Nusra, going on like Western TV programs in a suit and saying like, ah, you know, uh, Al Qaeda has some ideas, but really, you know, we're, we're just about being against Assad and, and pretending like that's, you know, meaningful, but it could a actually wind up with them getting more support from the West or something like that. Uh, of course, terrifying connor what if they decide that we need to evacuate these people or something like that uh that you know syria is coming in and and these are the people that we had previously backed in syria and would and would work with turkey to evacuate them although i think turkey understands that these jihadists are a real problem and not anything to play around with there's an increasing trend in the Middle East where Arab states are recognizing that, you know, no matter what the U.S. does, Assad will remain as uh, the leader of the Syrian state and continue to sit on the throne in Damascus. And because of that, they need to make peace with him. And so they're, they're you know, increasingly uh, having different kind of interactions with the Syrian government, foreign ministers meeting, uh, traveling to each other's capitals. I believe Syria is going to hold the Arab Energy Conference in 2024. Uh, you know, these are significant things that states do when they have normal relations. And so this is uh, this this is important. And U.S. lawmakers, including Gregory Meads, Michael McCall, uh, Bob Menendez, and Jim Rich are going to introduce a bill and are condemning what these Arab states are doing uh, in normalizing ties with Assad. Now, of course, that's what would be best for the Syrian people. But, you know, the United States doesn't care. And normalizing relations with Assad means the U.S. foreign policy of regime change in Syria failed. And so they would rather keep that up, even if it means and is at the expense and suffering of the Syrian people. There was a trial uh, for Sergeant First Class Nikosin, who apparently or was accused of a misconduct that caused a gunfight between the United States and uh, Syrian army forces. And I believe this is in August of 2020. 
I talked about the incident on the show. I, I distinctly remember talking about, it, but uh, apparently still all the details of this incident are unknown. And in part, it seems because uh, Sergeant uh, Nicholson uh, ordered uh, Nicholson art ordered his uh, troopers to delete the footage. But the reports are that this guy rolled up to a Syrian army checkpoint and immediately started making threats that we're going to kill you. And this led to a shootout between the two sides and one Syrian soldier being killed and another one being injured at his court martial he was acquitted so you know there's a couple things that I, I think could be happening here Connor one is that the military ordered him to do something insane he did it and then you know that they, they essentially tried to throw him under the bus and he was acquitted at the court martial or you know maybe he was acquitted after he did something completely reckless uh, not sure but again there was an incident that happened here it seemed to generally be at the instigation of the americans and a syrian soldier ended up dead uh, I believe you mentioned this in the, in the past on the show in relation to China, but just want to bring it up again because I think it is important that Syria has officially signed on to China's Belt and Road Initiative. And one of the reasons uh, that this is so important is because the U.S. sanctions on Syria are really depriving that country and preventing it from any way being able to rebuild and recover uh, from the civil war that lasted well over a decade in that country. And, and so, the, you know, this could be significant counter not only to like China's geopolitical ambitions, uh, but also for Syria, giving them uh, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, supply chain to start to rebuild their country from. Now, the last note on sanctions is actually maybe some good news, and that is uh, the Lebanese uh, prime minister's office, and, and that would be the, like, the Sunni part of the Lebanese government, said that the United States would... I don't know, maybe give an official waiver, but like gave an unofficial like promise to the Lebanese that nobody would be sanctioned if Lebanon were to purchase energy that uh, tran went through or was uh, potentially even in some way uh, processed or uh, something in Syria. This will be key to Lebanon, where I understand that they only have a few hours of power a day. There's street protests going on. Uh, there's an economic calamity in, in that country. Of course, this could be helpful for Syria, generating some revenue that they could, of course, use to, to you know, maybe rebuild that country. And then, you know, Jordan or, or Egypt could, of course, benefit as well. Now, then I saw this story, and I'm not exactly sure uh, how it ties together, but the U.S. is denying that it brokered an energy deal between Israel and Lebanon. And so initially, I believe it was reported that the deal between Israel and Lebanon was to essentially cut out the Syrian state. But now the U.S. is saying that that, that, that deal is not in play. So there could be a multitude of things going on there, but I just want to point that out because, you know, if this deal does happen and, and this energy does start going through Syria into Lebanon, it's going to make a big difference to the people in, in Lebanon and in Syria. And it seems that the U.S. is, you know, playing games and kind of depriving them of that and, you know, more interested in playing geopolitics when, you know, the people of Lebanon are just trying to keep their houses warm and, and things like that. So and that's the news I have on Syria. Anything before we wrap up here, Connor? No, I think uh, you summed it up. Uh... I mean, um, I was just devastating to hear because obviously, I mean, the first thing I thought when we saw all this uh, stuff going on in Haska is that the occupation is, I mean, really there to maintain, to keep Syria, you know, it, keep it held down under all this rubble. I mean, we talked last week about the Belt and Road Initiative and how their, you know, 80 percent of their population is in poverty. Sixty percent of the population is close to starvation, like twelve point four million people or something like that. Um, and it's going to cost hundreds of billions of dollars to rebuild the country. And meanwhile, I mean, if the Syrians and the Iranians and the Russians were left to their own devices, it, it wouldn't be pretty. But I don't think ISIS would be running all over Deir Zor like they are uh, now. Uh, and of course, it's entirely complicated by the fact that Syria, I mean, that the U.S. occupies a third of the country. And, um, you know, I mean, the official uh, policy of the administration is to absolutely oppose reconstruction there. And so it's 
really disheartening to see these lawmakers coming out and trying to prevent normalization going on uh, between these Arab states and Syria. And it reminds me of what you know they do uh, with the way the hawks treat. Uh, what they should be, you know, happy to see um, more and more normalization of relations with the Iranians, but usually they're trying to throw a wrench into it with the by continuing the maximum pressure campaign, and always being hawkish on Iran and their allies. And I'll just say before we wrap up, Connor, and and it should probably go without saying, but this isn't an endorsement of China's Belt and Road policy. And I do understand that you're making a deal with the Chinese devil when you, you know, make these kind of big infrastructure agreements and things like that. And, you know, there's probably a lot of corruption that's going to take place. People well connected to the Chinese government, people well connected to Bashar al-Assad will profit off of it. However, when your country is rubble, you know, maybe you need to make a deal with the devil, especially... Uh, when, you know, the American devil is preventing anybody from helping your country build. So uh, it, it's just the situation that we've placed the Syrians in. And again, not that it's great that they're taking this deal with China. Not that if I were the leader of Syria, maybe I would, you know, do something like that. But it's kind of understandable given the geopolitical situation that uh, America uh, has created. Anyways, Connor, thanks so much again for doing the show. Uh, Freeman's Mind 90 sits on Twitter. Uh, your work is is at the Libertarian Institute. Keep an eye out for your next uh, article, everyone. And um, yeah, follow the show, YouTube, Rumble, Odyssey, uh, blog at antiwar.com, uh, at con underscore interest on Twitter. I'm at Kyle Anslone underscore. And uh, donate Patreon, subscribe star, crypto information in the show notes page. Buy your CBD at Paloma Verde. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kyle.